Hi, I'm Becky Waring Steele. And I'm Libby Barbie. Welcome to the Denver Art Museum's first ever Untitled Creative Fusion at Home. Libby and I are proud to be the two featured artists for this three part series. We collaborated with the Denver Art Museum and other creatives from Colorado and the Southwest to develop an online event full of fun and unexpected experiences. Our theme for this three part series is Unearthing Place. Inspired by the work of Homer and Remington in the exhibition Natural Forces, we wanted to curate a program that investigates the concept of frontier and the many associations and contradictions that come with it. We're interested in looking at this place, the American West, through multiple lenses. Enjoy. Enjoy. Hey folks, I'm here to close out this program on a personal note and to share with you a little about an artist who really inspires me and who has always influenced the work that I make. For over a decade, I've been making artwork that investigates the relationship between humans and the natural world, specifically focusing on American frontier myth and the mediating role that it plays in the relationship between American identity and the Western landscape. Winslow Homer and Frederick Remington have of course produced some of the most iconic images of the American West. And should the coronavirus give us a break anytime soon, their work will be hanging at the Denver Art Museum where thousands of Coloradans will flock to see it. But there is another artist who I find inspiring and whose artwork will probably never hang at the Denver Art Museum. That artist is my uncle Don. Don lives in a skilled nursing facility in South Denver that cares for adults with various kinds of disabilities. His nursing home is currently experiencing an outbreak of COVID-19, which is really not good news for the 68 residents and many staff members who will all likely be exposed to the virus. But that hasn't stopped my Uncle Don, who spends the majority of his days making art about the American West. You see, at one time, Don was a true outdoorsman and one of the most skilled skeet shooters around. He even played mountain man from time to time with the local muzzleloading club. Don has struggled with mental illness and felt mental disabilities all his life. He's never lived alone without the care of my grandparents or other adults who can help him with his daily activities. But he taught me how to shoot my Daisy VV gun when I was five, and later how to fish, hunt, throw a hatchet, and strike a spark with flint and steel. He also taught me how to draw deer and rabbits, and how to burn those designs onto pieces of wood using a magnifying glass. He taught me how to weld scraps of metal from the auto body shop that my grandfather helped him run into not quite lifelike fish and turtles, and how to whittle some pretty awkward birds from scraps of wood. Artwork has always been Don's way of making sense of a world that he never fully understood. Today, he creates images wherever and with whatever he can. Often the scenery that he envisions is reminiscent of Homer and Remington themselves. Images of Western landscapes, deer, elk, pheasants, and dove painted straight onto the sidewalks around his nursing home. Like any great male artist, he doesn't shy away from taking up the occasional traditional mood. But more often, he hangs handcrafted paper birds in the trees outside or paints herds of deer on the footbridge in the nearby park. Once when we went to visit, we found him down in the creek in that same park where he had just placed three cardboard duck decoys. Don deploys a special kind of urban graffiti that probably won't soon be co-opted by those rhino developers. His art will probably not ever make it into a gallery, let alone the Denver Art Museum. But in my book, his art is the most extraordinary kind of art the kind that is made from the pure joy of creating and given generously to everyone around. You see, we're all artists. You, me, and my Uncle Don. And it is our art that will get us through this thing in a world that we can't fully understand. Hi, my name is Dylan McLaughlin, and I'm an Albuquerque, New Mexico-based sound and video artist. It feels like 
incoherence. It feels stationary to me. It feels stagnant, but stagnant with motion, with progression, with lapse, time, lapse. I'm thinking about space. I'm thinking about place. I'm thinking about motion and vibration and frequency. The composition you're hearing is about repetition. It's about chaos and repetition. It's about moving forward. It's about staying still. It's about progression. It's about recession. It's stationary and it's fluid. It's floating, it's flying, it's moving. It's static, it's still. How do we expand when we're still? And so I think of it as a series of meditations, a series of practices, a series of how do I spend my time? Hi, I'm Lauren Thompson, and I'm the interpretive specialist for Western American Art at DAM, and was part of the planning team for Natural Forces, Winslow Homer, and Frederick Remington. Episode 3 of Entitled at Home, Unearthing Place is about sparking inspiration, about what could happen in a perfect world. When I think about the exhibition and the work of Homer and Remington through this lens, my mind and my eyes wander to the horizon lines they create, where earth meets the sky. That place is the future. It's about hope, where the promise of a new day begins. Both artists often like to play with a high horizon line, where you, the viewer, are placed lower to the ground, and you imagine yourself looking up and outwards into the distance. Here in Homer's The West Wind, you see how he's placed this solitary figure right at the horizon line. She's framed in rolling white clouds, her eyes looking off somewhere we cannot see yet. That's the thing about a horizon line. It's always moving relative to where you are. You can't ever seem to reach it. It's a place of aspiration as well. For Remington, the horizon is often where the action lives, like in this wonderful monochromatic painting depicting a famous battle in the Spanish-American War. Other times, it's where he wants to draw in your eye, but the action is quieter and Remington is telling a different kind of story. In Fall of the Cowboy, we see a writer He too is straddling earth and sky, but he and his partner have been out in the cold for a while, at work repairing a fence. For Remington, the fencing off of the western frontier meant the end of an era, of his perfect world that never really existed but in his imagination. Both artists drew inspiration from their imaginations and their lived experiences. Perhaps a perfect world exists somewhere in between those two places. Hi, my name is Christina Maldonado Badhan, and today I'm going to be telling you and showing you a little bit about Ledger Art for the April Untitled event. So Ledger Art is a narrative um, primarily done by Plains Tribes and was done on paper and cloth, uh, mostly Ledger papers. So that would be things like this, and you'll see more of that in a minute here but it um, flourished primarily from the 1860s to 1920. And then it revived um, around 1960 through 1970. And then recently there's been a lot of indigenous artists who have revisited it and kind of modernized it. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of my artwork. Um, I tend to bring ledger art into a digital uh, kind of screen, so. 
All right, so this is my personal website, um, personal art website that you can see here. This is a ledger art style um, painting. So the ledger paper was scanned. It was given to me by a really good friend. And then I drew my horse and my indigenous warrior woman on my computer using Photoshop. So that's some of my graphic design work. But you can see I've got other ledger art style artworks. This is a piece for missing and murdered indigenous women. And this piece here is a crow on ledger paper. Um, again, most of these are done through scanning um, watercolor textures and then I overlay it on my Photoshop. And I do digital painting to create those ledger looks. This is a piece I did for um, the Indigenous Futures Collective. They uh, asked for this piece. And then there's my Indigenous Wonder Woman. So those are just a couple of my examples of um, digital ledger art. So now I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna show you uh, traditional style of ledger art. So this piece I started working on the other day, uh, I call it Daughters. So I've got my woman and then my two girls standing here. The medium that I used here is watercolor, um, pencil, and ink. I don't have a ton of time today, so this is our traditional style of ledger art. You saw a little bit of the digital style, so thank you guys for tuning in, and I hope to see you soon. Hello, everybody. I'm Dakota Hoska, and I am here with Donna Christjohn. I am the Assistant Curator of Native Arts at the Denver Art Museum. And Donna and I were originally supposed to do an untitled event at the museum, but we are here with you on our um, lovely Teams app, and we're gonna just have a discussion about one of Remington's paintings. Donna, go ahead and introduce yourself. Donna Christian, Machiapi Kisho, Rosebud and Matahan, Nale Hall, Inglewood, Elwatiha, Inawayaki, um Phyllis Claremont, Ichiapi, Na Atewayaki, Ed Stone, Ichiapi, Iyuha Chante, Washtenape, Chizapi. Um, hi, my name is Donna Christian. Um, I'm excited to do this discussion. And currently I um, I live here in Denver. I work at a law firm, but I'm um, also currently the co-chair of the Denver American Indian Commission. Thank you so much for being with us. And today we're going to talk about one of the paintings in the um, Homer Remington show, Natural Forces, that's at the Denver Art Museum. And there are other resources for you too, so you can explore the exhibition more in depth. But today we're gonna start by talking about uh, a painting by uh, Frederick Remington entitled Indian Warfare. And Donna and I have had an original discussion about this last week. And one of the things that uh, Donna said, and I'd like you to kind of go over it again for us, was how uh, these men are just uh, riding fearlessly and it almost looks like they're just like riding to their death. And you had some really funny comments about that. I yeah. mean, it's not funny they're riding to their death, but the interpretation <laughs> of it. Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're either seen as as fighting to our death or as dead. So it's it's not as though we're we're seen. I this is just a romanticized version, another romanticized or the romanticized version of um, our warriors and the the way that we are portrayed. So um, yeah, that's my take on this. Is um, just just that stereotype. Um, that leaves us frozen in time um, that definitely contributes um, largely to our invisibility today because that is how we're seen. One thing um, that I really like that you were talking about is 
although this is a stereotyped image of us or uh, this you see this kind of image a lot rarely is it discussed about how adept we were at fighting on the plains and how adept we you know really how proficient we were as warriors not me myself because i can't ride horse but these guys were i mean we were good right right very skilled um and that that is a piece that's left out of a lot of literature or or any um explanation of these these paintings is actually how skilled we were at riding horses and then how skilled we were um as gunmen so and we had a whole discussion about the the arrows and our skills of being able to fi fire off three arrows while um you know our uh, counter white counterparts were reloading their guns. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that's m definitely missing from a lot of these. What is utopia? If you could build a perfect society, what would it look like? How would people interact? Where would everyone live? And how would it be governed? For artist Becky Waring Steele, these were questions she started contemplating after the 2016 presidential election. Yeah, I actually remember the moment it first popped into my head. I was walking to the bus. I would take the 15 bus down Colfax in the mornings to get to work and just noticing all the different people in my neighborhood. It's a very diverse community. And it was right after the you know 2016 election. And I think I felt in many ways a loss of community, but then walking around and you know really seeing people in their day-to-day -day lives really, I don't know, gave me this feeling that there's this larger community that I'm a part of and figuring out a new way to tap into it and ways to take these more complex societal issues that I think within the structure of our current society can seem really overwhelming to find the solutions. So this idea came to me that if I were to create a society on a smaller scale that was a little more manageable for people to realize they could start from square one, what would they do? What are the things that they would want to integrate into their world? Because I think sometimes when you look at it under you know all all the the rules and regulations that are set up for us now it seems really overwhelming to make changes but i figured that if i was able to scale a society down to a more manageable size for people to really be able to you know take a step back and really envision themselves in that space and what that would feel like rather than taking the baggage from everyday life with them too Becky decided she would build a miniature utopia. But she didn't want to build it all by herself. She wanted it to be a community project. So she created an application for others to become citizens of her utopia, asking applicants to explain why they were interested in the project and what skills they could bring to a new society. At first, the application was just on paper and passed out to friends and fellow artists in Denver. But eventually, Becky put the application online and she started getting people from other parts of the country and even other parts of the world applying. Once someone becomes a citizen of Utopia, they submit a photo so that Becky can make a miniature version of them to live in the miniature model of Utopia. I do integrate some traditional modeling materials into my work, so, you know, a lot of things to, meant to replicate the scenery in our everyday environment, so, you know, little scale model trees that are made out of wire and uh, flocking fibers to give the looks of leaves, uh, flocking for grass, so little nylon and rayon fibers that help to emulate that. A lot of my work really deals with symbols because it's relying on your eye to fill in a lot of the details. So it's really hinting at little details, but not getting you know, too microscopic with the detail because the human eye will make up a lot of what's in between. Um, I like to integrate a lot of natural materials into my work as well, so uh, sands and stones and crystals. And for Utopia, the earthship dwellings themselves, I'm using a polymer clay meant to look more like the earthen clay dwellings. 
Utopia to me is just all, all the little things. Just really taking time, I think, to slow down in your day-to-day -day life and really think about all the systems that are, you know, currently in place, but not thinking about them in this really rigid sense that this is exactly how things need to be and how they need to function. So I think utopia is almost kind of this disruption of what our typical view of society is. I think a lot of people look at it and go, well, I mean, that's not possible. And there's many things, you know, within utopias that aren't entirely possible, but I think it's taking those positive elements from those and just really trying to integrate those things into your day-to-day -day lives and just really, just being really careful with people. Like just, I don't know, just really, you know, being careful with your environment, being careful with the people who you interact yourselves with, you know, like just, being aware of all these other things that are happening outside yourself. What is your role in these situations? And, you know, how can you improve upon things on a daily basis? Um, yeah, I mean, not just for yourself, but for, for everyone. Yeah, it's, it's tricky times right now. And I think that things feel very divisive. So I hope that another takeaway for people from this exhibition is just being able to, you know, talk about these more complex issues, but not talking about them in a way that there's a right and a wrong. There's a gray area in between. There's many ways that we can meet in the middle. And I think the most important thing is just that we're having these conversations so that we don't feel so disconnected moving forward. Two, three. Utopia, utopia, and That's a wrap for tonight's Untitled Creative Fusion at Home. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's episode. And thank you to all of our incredible collaborators. Bye.